Understanding why gate speed does not tell the full story. Spontaneous walking speed is a well-known measure for functional capabilities. It's often used as an indication of performance and to monitor the level of progress. For instance, in 2003, Stadinsky reported that walking speed in older adults is a clinically meaningful indicator of physical health status. Because of its strong clinometric properties to predict future health status and functional decline, walking speed has been associated with survival rates in community-dwelling adults aged 65 years and older. In 2009, Fritz and Lasardi suggested that walking speed was the sixth vital sign of health, claiming it is one of the most important signs that indicate the status of the body's vital functions along with temperature and pulse. Of course, some ideas need to be kept in mind when considering gait speed. Everyone has a preferential spontaneous walking speed. This comfort speed zone is determined within plus or minus one kilometer per hour where there is no significant difference in energy cost. For healthy adults, this speed ranges between 2.7 and 3.6 miles per hour or 1.2 meters per second and 1.6 meters per second. Donahue reported in 2016 that being able to significantly change walking speed when necessary affects the ability of a subject to adapt to different situations in daily life. Therefore, the speed difference between the spontaneous pace and the fast pace can be seen as a marker of functional reserves of a person and their adaptability. The speed represents the overall performance of walking, which is an easy variable to record. It may simply be calculated as the distance traveled divided by the time required. It is also, however, the product of step length or stride length and cadence. Consequently, this has to do with the size of the lower limb. So, these parameters should be normalized when assessing long-term follow-up in children or comparing a patient against normative data. Scaling gait data has been acknowledged and verified for a long time now. Hoff's well-known letter to the editor in the fourth issue of Gait and Posture was published in 1996. That, unfortunately, did not lead to the universal acceptance of normalization. In a brand new chapter in the Handbook of Human Motion, Hoff again considers geometric scaling and gives several reasons. Very often, patient data has to be compared to normal data of healthy subjects. Historically, when this normative data was collected, scaling was not used not to mention, many normative data sets were collected in software packages with conservative output formats. These formats are understandable in view of the reprogramming expense and the customer's expectations. It may also be mentally easier to consider what one meter per second against a dimensionless variable means. Hence, scaling data remains mostly the prerogative of researchers and clinicians who want to be able to publish. Because gait speed is dependent on both step length and cadence, it is possible to produce the same speed via multiple configurations ranging from fast small steps to slow long steps. This figure represents step length in meters as a function of walking cadence expressed in steps per minute. Each blue line corresponds to a different speed and highlights that an infinite number of step length and cadence configurations can lead to the same walking speed. The green circle indicates the range of speed that can be seen in healthy adults, as well as the normal configuration to achieve it. In other words, as previously stated, if asymptomatic adults move about 1.2 to 1.6 meters per second, they do not take very large steps at low frequency nor take very small steps at high frequency. Moreover, while the cadence increases linearly, the step length, which is more constrained by the physical aspect, increases logarithmically. It can change greatly at low speeds, but tends to stabilize at higher speeds. 
Solely considering walking speed is not enough to properly analyze the progress of a subject over time. Why is the step length and step rate configuration important? Preferential gait speed in a healthy person is very close to one that minimizes the energy expenditure per unit distance. However, that is only correct if the step rate is freely chosen. Zara and Radcliffe in 1978 showed that the freely chosen step rate requires the least oxygen consumption at any given speed. Any other forced step rate at the same speed increases the oxygen cost required for the free step rate. Interestingly, several studies by Nagasaki and Sakaya between 1995 and 1998 further demonstrated that the most optimal energy consumption per distance was to keep the ratio of step length to step rate invariant. The walk ratio, as they termed it, represents the relationship between the amplitude and the frequency of movement of the legs. It is calculated as the mean step length divided by the cadence. Sakaya et al. in 1996 found that in control adults, the walk ratio is relatively invariant through a speed range from slow to very fast that is independent of the speed. However, some investigators found that the walk ratio was higher at very slow walking speeds than at preferred and high speeds. In 1998, Sakaya and Nagasaki were able to show that the walk ratio has a good overall test-retest reliability. On the previous graph, we now add red lines that each represent a different walk ratio. An identical walk ratio means that regardless of the size of the step length and the cadence, their relative proportion is always the same. Thus, one can present the same walk ratio while walking at different walking speeds. Let's take time to check that the walk ratio is actually independent of the speed. One healthy young adult walked at several paces from very, very slow to very, very fast. While the speed increases linearly through the condition, you can see in the graph on the right that the walk ratio ranges between 0.53 and 0.55. This shows the configuration between step length and cadence does not change. Walking with an invariant walk ratio would be optimal in terms of energy expenditure, temporal variability, spatial variability, and attentional demand. This figure from Sakaya et al.'s 1997 publication shows the representation of the different walking speeds and the different walk ratio obtained as a function of step length and cadence. The concentric circles illustrate the spatial variability represented by the standard deviation of the step length. The more the circles move away from the center, the greater the variability. Thus, it becomes clear that the variability increases for a lower speed and for a higher speed than the preferential walking speed. This is also true if the walk ratio decreases when the cadence is too high relative to the step length or increases when the cadence is too small relative to the step length. This seems interesting, but how can we transfer the walk ratio to clinical evaluation of walking? What about the literature? First, it is possible that the walking speed may be reduced due to several reasons in pathological gait. For example, fatigue, confidence, or cognitive load. However, being that the walk ratio is independent from walking speed, it can discriminate the specific effects of intervention treatments on gait coordination from the effects of walking speed. Therefore, this parameter might be of particular interest for the longitudinal monitoring of a patient to provide information on the rhythmic organization of gait, especially during rehabilitation. In previous articles by Nagasaki et al., the walk ratio has been found to be smaller in older adults than in the young, 
and tends to decrease with age. Murray et al. also found that it tends to become smaller in patients with Parkinson's disease when the severity of their symptoms increase. Rhoda et al. in 2011 and Caron in 2016 found similar results in patients with multiple sclerosis. Additionally, according to Kalasea et al. in 2012, the risk of falls increases in older people with greater reduction in walk ratio when changing to fast walking. Calron's study in 2016 with multiple sclerosis patients reflected the same results. Studies performed by Suzuki et al. in 1999 on stroke survivors have demonstrated that the walk ratio decreases in these patients and increase following a rehabilitation program. In 2004, Burrell and colleagues investigated Minier's patients with a curative unilateral vestibular neurotomy, UVN, by goal-directed linear locomotion. They demonstrated the possibility to use the walk ratio to document impaired locomotor pattern prior to UVN and during recovery at one week, one month, and three months post-UVN using data from walking eyes open and eyes closed. Although walk ratio is mostly reduced in patients, in some cases it is also possible to find an increased walk ratio. Men's et al. in 2003 found increased walk ratio in healthy adults walking on an irregular surface compared to a level surface. This condition caused a reduced cadence and an increased step length. The authors explained it was likely that the maintenance of stability took precedence over efficiency when walking under this challenging condition, thus justifying the increased walk ratio. When patients use walking aids, especially canes and walkers, the walk ratio can be affected. These assistive devices help to maintain a certain step length while cadence is more affected, which leads to an increased walk ratio. A rollator walker tends to have the opposite effect, with a shorter step length and a higher cadence leading to a smaller walk ratio. Therefore, clinicians should be careful during follow-up sessions with patients who change assistive devices or no longer use an assistive device as rehabilitation progresses. Shown here is the walk ratio for a person with Parkinson's disease, walking with a cane and walking with a rollator. As previously mentioned, the two walking aids lead to diametrically opposite walk ratios. For the same speed of about 0.4 meters per second, walking with a cane induces a high ratio, while walking with a rollator induces a low walk ratio. Finally, few studies have looked at the walk ratio in children, but Hillman et al. in 2009 demonstrated that a normalized walk ratio refined between ages 7 and 11 years old. That means that intrasubject variability decreases with age to a stable configuration. Moreover, in a 2011 PhD thesis, Guell presented normative data for walk ratio and normalized walk ratio in children from 1 to 13 years old. This figure represents means with a 95% confidence interval for the walk ratio in children from 1 to adulthood. This unpublished walk ratio comes from the same data set used by Guell at Al's publication in 2016 and demonstrates how the walk ratio evolves in children and adolescents. As you can see here, young toddlers walk with small steps and increased cadence, inducing a really low walk ratio. In this new example, we follow the changes from pre to post Botox injection in the walk ratio of a child with cerebral palsy. While it changes slightly after toxin injection, 
the walk ratio is significantly more improved when walking with an orthosis due to the increase in step length. Considering children's outcomes brings us back to the question of the best computation for the walk ratio. Special attention must be paid because the values for the walk ratio change depending on the parameters, the units, and the normalization. The first difference that should be taken into account is the choice of gait reference, either step or stride. Then units to express these parameters should be considered. Cadence is expressed as per minute or per second, while step and stride length are usually expressed in meters, centimeters, or sometimes even millimeters. Next, the variables can be normalized or not according to anthropometric measurement of the subject and acceleration of gravity. On Earth, gravity can be taken into account rhetorically because even if you do a gait assessment on the top of Mount Everest, your normalized outcomes won't be that different. Just keep in mind if you compare walks on Earth to walks on Mars where the gravity is 2.6 times smaller. The choice of the distance used to normalize data also has some influence on the walk ratio. The distance used most often is the length of the lower limb. Due to the multiple combinations of these parameters, caution should be exercised when comparing data from the literature. When using non-normalized variables with step length in centimeters and cadence in steps per minute, Keep in mind that the walk ratio in normal adults is usually between 0.55 and 0.70. In conclusion, despite its simplicity, the walk ratio can be proposed as a routine complement to the functional assessment of gait in patients. While other gait parameters, kinematic or kinetic, change with walking speeds, the walk ratio is independent of speed. Therefore, for follow-up, it provides an appropriate summary index of neuromotor control, regardless of baseline speed or speed increments associated with treatments. All the references used to create this presentation are listed. Do not hesitate to contact us if you would like the full version of one of these articles.